Today's webinar is Supporting Instruction and Learning Through Artificial Intelligence. Our webinar today is hosted in partnership with Wiley University Services. And my name is Megan Raymond. I lead programs, events, sponsorship, and membership here at WCET. So it's great to see so many familiar names and new names in the participant list today. Thank you for joining us. As we go through today, you can access the slides via the link in chat. And we are recording this and we'll send the link out to the recording as well as any resources that were shared. We'll probably send that out late this week. During the conversation, as you have questions, and I know you will, please enter them into the question box. And then chat is a great place to share other resources, comment, suggest things that we might wanna look into further, but try not to put your questions in there because sometimes they do get lost and we hate for that to happen. If you wanna follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. And again, we'll share all of these wonderful resources with you later this week. Today's moderator is a friend and colleague here at WCET. Van Davis is the Chief Strategy Officer with WCET, and he's also the Service Di Design and Strategy Officer with Every Learner Everywhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Van. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are. We are thrilled to have you with us. This is going to be, I think, a fantastic, um, discussion about generative artificial intelligence, something that is on everyone's mind right now. Um, before I have our panelists introduce themselves, I'm just very quickly going to set the stage for us, and then we'll have introductions and jump right in. Um, <clears throat> word about terminology. For the most part today, we're talking about generative artificial intelligence. If you're not familiar with that term, that's a form of AI that can create new content, such as audio, text, images, video, code, uh, because it is trained on an enormous amount of information. Uh, generative AI, an example of generative AI is ChatGPT, uh, Microsoft's Bing, Google's Bard, uh, a uh, text-to-image generative AI um, program would be Dolly 2, which is also done by OpenAI, which is the um, creator of ChatGPT. Um, text generative AI like ChatGPT and Bing and BART basically are predictive engines on steroids. What they're doing is because they're trained on so much data, their neural networks are figuring out what they think the most logical next word in a string is going to be. That means that sometimes they create really amazing results and sometimes they hallucinate and they don't always tell the truth. And I suspect that um, the impact of that in classes is something that we will probably be touching on uh, in this webinar. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. We'll start with uh, Capri and then just go down the list and then we'll jump right in with some questions. Capri? Thank you, Van. Hello, everybody. My name is Capri Livingston. I'm a program strategy manager at Wiley University Services, where we support career connected education across 70 uh, nonprofit institutions and more than 850 degree programs. At Wiley, I work alongside college and university leadership to elevate learning experiences and their online academic endeavors. Thank you for having me. Hello, I'm Michael Ratajczyk. Um, You'll see in chat there, I just put a little funny thing related to chat GPT and reality. Uh, so again, Ratajczyk is how we pronounce our name here. Um, I'm the program director for business intelligence, academic programs at the undergrad, graduate level, face-to-face, uh, -face, asynchronous, synchronous, online, uh, certificates in artificial intelligence, uh, healthcare analytics, business analytics, essentially all of that stuff. I'm also a fourth year PhD student in artificial intelligence with my dissertation focused on corporate adoption of AI tools. So literally last November, ChatGPT and OpenAI fell into my lap as a final stage dissertation uh, student. So I've been researching this stuff for, for many years uh, because th this kind of stuff isn't necessarily new. Chat boxes and chat bots are not new. It's just now they're democratized and available to so many people now uh, that can get their hands on it. So uh, appreciate being here. Thanks.
Hi, I'm David Rettinger. I'm on the faculty at the University of Tulsa. I'm now actually applied professor of, psycho of psychology. Uh, I served in the past as president of the International Center for Academic Integrity and have been working in the academic integrity space as a scholar, as an administrator, um, and as, of course, a teacher for about the last 20 years or so. So I've been giving a lot of thought to what academic integrity looks like. And of course, everything's been turned upside down in the last six months or so um, with the new um, generative AI tools. And so we're giving a lot of thought to what does integrity mean in the, in the new context going forward. So it's great to be here. Thank you all for having me. Howdy, I'd like to thank WCET for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'm Judith Sebesta, and I am the founder and principal of Sebesta Education Consulting, LLC. I worked with Van to develop on behalf of WCET a national survey on supporting instruction and learning through AI. So I'll be speaking to that research primarily today. Thank you. Thanks, folks. So we have a quick polling question before we get started. Kim, if you wanna launch that poll. We're curious if you are personally using generative AI in your work. I'll give folks a, um, a few moments there to respond to that question. And then we're going to, to jump in and, and start with academic integrity. Kim, how are we looking? We about ready to close it out. All right. So we are about evenly split. I think this is really interesting. Um, when we ask folks if you are using generative AI in your work, 46% of you said yes, 54% of you said no. So we are almost completely evenly split in terms of how you are personally using this professionally. Um, I want to start with a question that keeps coming up both in the um, registration as well as in the general discussion about academic integrity. Uh, and I actually want to start with Judith, but then David, I'm going to go over to you um, with your work and then um, Capri and Michael can, can chime in as you see fit. But Judith, I know that academic integrity was something that came up quite a bit in the polling, in the survey results. So maybe you'd like to speak to what we found in our survey. Sure, Van, just, just briefly some highlights. And, and by the way, the report for the survey should be coming out within the next few weeks, I, I think. Van can probably speak to that a little bit later. But um, the main point I wanted to convey about those survey results was that I think maybe not surprisingly for many of you, the highest percentage, a majority at 56% of existing planned or considered use of AI is for detecting AI generated content or plagiarism. Editing was close behind, by the way. The concerns about AI and academic integrity um, via these survey data, um, in other words, preventing cheating are a focus clearly for many institutions. And it was the top reason given for not using AI, those concerns. And those who will or have or who will develop policy or have policies around AI currently primarily do so around academic integrity. And, and the last point about these survey data I would like to make related to academic integrity is that while the primary challenge to using AI identified by survey respondents was lack of expertise among faculty and administrators, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, that was followed closely by lack of policies and guidelines and concerns about protecting academic integrity. Thanks, Judith. Uh, David, what do you think about this question of um, folks being concerned about generative AI and academic integrity? I know this is something that you're working very closely on. Uh, yes, Van, and let me say, Judith, oh boy, those responses are, are disturbing on many levels. Um, and I think what disturbs me the most is the notion that people are still clinging to the idea that you're going to be able to detect AI written text in a meaningful way. And even, even when, when we're looking at GPT-3 in the first part of the year, um, lots of tools came out very quickly to detect it. And I think the data are now starting to come in. They're not very good. Um, they don't work real well. 
Um, they're very good at detecting the cases on which they're trained. They're not very good at detecting new cases. And all of them were built on GPT-3, which is now basically not really in use anymore. Um, it's, you know, it's basically like leaded fuel cars at this point. I, we need to get away from the notion that you're going to be able to, to use technology to, to solve this problem. Because the problem is not the technology. The problem is a mismatch between what we're asking students to do and what the tools are available for them to do it. To keep, to keep a, a, no metaphor really works great, but have any, is anyone out there really thinking they should punish their students for using the Microsoft Word grammar checker, right? That's, that's generative AI. Well, it's not generative, but it's nearly generative AI. And we all use it. We all use spell checker. We all use the electric dryer at our house. These are all tools that were once considered high-tech energy savers. There's no moral valence to any of these tools right now um, because our, our understanding of what it means to do laundry or to write a paper has changed. And so whether we like it or not, we as academics are going to be brought into a world where there are tools that help you write good text. How good that text is, is a different, is to, you know, the, that's going to change over time. So detection, prevention, all of that stuff is a short-term problem. The long-term problem is what does it mean to write something in a world where a machine is your co-author? Just in the same way that we use stats software to help us do complex um, SPSS type or R calculations, just as Michael, I'm sure, uses some really fancy BI tools to do vid data visualization. No one, no one criticizes Michael for not using graph paper, right? That, that world is done. And so the question is going to be, how do we transition from a pre-AI, generative AI world to an endemic, sorry to use that term, generative AI world? That transition is going to be difficult. Or maybe you want to say something about what you see as that transition from where you're sitting. Yeah, I'll just round out the conversation and say, I think we can all agree, you know, learners should be completing assessments and activities honestly. Um, academic integrity will continue to be a complex problem for higher ed. Um, so really what that means for us is we need to, um, you know, to take this into an action standpoint, we as educators need to continue to mediate issues with design best practices and thinking of, you know, some of the greatest influences for learners. So when I say that, what, what do I mean exactly? Um, I'm talking about the power of authentic assessment, um, the power of instructor, you know, instructional presence to boost student motivation. Um, we have to shift the focus, you know, away from learning and more leaning into, you know, fo focusing more on learning and leaning less from um, instruction and teaching. So, you know, assessment should be, you know, meaningful, relevant, applicable. So if you're worried, you know, if someone on this call is worried about students using, you know, generative AI, then you really need to start asking the question, which is, why are they turning to generative AI to complete the assessment dishonestly, or dare I say, even fraudulently? Um, and so this is where we're finding it becoming increasingly more important to design learning experiences that encourages students to honestly complete assessments. And that really does require students, you know, tapping into their motivation. And the one way we can do that is through authentic assessment. And, you know, here at Wiley University Services, we've been exploring ways to do that. So I'll just uh, uh, close with, I think those, you know, closest to the classroom, you guys can have a tremendous impact on encouraging learners to focus on the experience and providing an environment conductive to actually doing that. Thank you. And, and Michael, what are you seeing on your campus over at St. Mary's? Yeah, well, I want to begin by just saying chat, chat GPT is just one tool, right? There's many, there's, there's hundreds, there's thousands. Now, everybody that has a business idea is developing their own generative AI tool, you know, in the education space, finance space. It's not all about writing papers. That's the majority of it because that's where our industry is at. We like to assign papers and essays and, and stuff like that. But there's also graphical design ones. There's also uses of ChatGPT or other tools to help you understand programming languages. Like, hey, my program isn't working. Here's my code. Can you help me identify why XYZ liter maybe literally is not working? So 
there are various uses of it. So we want to be careful to not just automatically go to, oh, the only, the only thing it's good for is writing papers. Um, there are other aspects. And so what I've been telling people on, on my campus, and I, I've been speaking at other campuses too, virtually, uh, since really Christmas break ended, because that's when everybody came back and started realizing something was dropped on our doorstep. Um, and I tell people, go play with it. Rewrite your assignment, write your assignment, paste your assignment into ChatGPT that you already have and see what comes back. Redo this assignment. You know, how would you improve this assignment? Or I would even say, give me a student-based response to this assignment. Uh, see how easy it is. You got to play with it to learn it. Um, and so that that's my perspective is I'm going to be using it and I'm helping teachers use it as a tool in the toolkit for learning. Like Higher Education, the Chronicle just came out with this quote, education is still a matter of teaching people how to access information and turn that information into knowledge. You know, I think back to the professors when I went to school that just pontificated from a podium, education has changed, even without ChatGPT. And so ChatGPT is just one more tool. Generative AI, I keep saying ChatGPT, but I do mean generative AI. So what, what I tell people, like what uh, David was saying, don't rely on a tool, uh, an anti-AI tool, because it's a tit for tat, just like cybersecurity and virus programs. There's gonna be iterations and it's just gonna keep going. There's a whole industry that'll be developed here. Um, get to know your students and expect to work harder. I'm sorry to say it, but expect to work harder as a teacher, as a coach, as a guide in your classrooms. That, that's what's going to have to happen. So. I think that you raise a, a really interesting point there at the end, Michael, that I want to drill down a little bit on, and that is this idea that we're moving from the assessment of information to the assessment of knowledge and application of knowledge. And so I wonder if we could spend a little bit of time talking about what this means for assessment. And, and Capri, I'm going to start with you because you sort of touched on this in the last question of, of what, what does this mean now for how we assess learning and knowledge from our students? Yeah, um, at Wiley University Services, we've actually been giving this quite a bit of thought. Um, so on one hand, we have Wiley designers that are giving attention to the learning experiences, you know, available to students. Uh, this includes, you know, dissuading learners from dishonestly completing assessments, um, authentic assessment, like I mentioned. Uh, but even with the advancement of AI, uh, there's still ways that we as educators can lean into assessment practices that are known for best for learning. So really, um, you know, how can we be authentic? How can we be relevant? How can we engage our learners? So that's one end of it. Um, there's another aspect that we're also focusing on, and one that's how do we actually leverage generative AI? How do we use it as a tool to prepare students for the workforce? And it's a changing landscape after graduation. It's going to look different. Um, than it did before. So now more than ever, um, you know, classrooms really should be leveraging that authentic assessment. And I do know uh, firsthand that Michael has been making some strides with this. Uh, he's been working with one of our designers here at Wiley. Um, so I'm not going to steal your thunder, Michael. Um, but I do think that there are ways that he's been transforming his classroom um, to being more meaningful, to being more relevant for that student experience. So uh, maybe we could turn it to Michael to share a little bit more about that. Yeah, Michael, why don't you share what you've been doing as a faculty member? I think that would be great. Yeah, so program director, but also a, a faculty member, kind of have two, two roles here. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to help myself, but I'm playing with these tools two hours a day and, and sometimes just for fun. And I learn more each time, get deeper and deeper. You know, David was talking about ChatGPT3, then it goes to 3.5. And four, and if you pay for the premium, you get the super fast speed and the more accurate results um, sooner, faster than the general audience. And same for Mid Journey and these other ones. So I've really been looking at now. I have a, I don't want to say it, I don't want to say it inaccurately, but um, you know, it's BI, it's analytical work. Direct once you graduate, or even during grad during your your schoolwork, you should be working in the industry based on what you're learning in the classroom immediately. If not, then I'm doing a bad job, you know, to prepare you for workforce, workforce development and what employers need. So um, on that note, 
employers use these tools. You know, Microsoft Office with the integration of AI tools, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop, they have widgets and things like that where you can now type in to, on one hand, if we're not teaching our students those skills, then before long, they're not gonna be employable because that will be the workforce expectation of being able to use tools like that. Um, so that's one point. But the other one more, more direct to the question is, I am looking at every single discussion board forum, every single one, and making sure they're tied together. And because you can fake personal experiences with ChatGPT, create a story based on the following information as if it sounds like, you know, I'm 25 years old living in Montana. You will get something that sounds personal. And if the faculty member just looks at that over real quick, because they got 40 other students in the class, um, you could be allowing the plagiarism to go, or not plagiarism, but well, technically, but you could, the dishonesty to go through, or you could be fooled. Maybe you are reading every single one of them and providing feedback. Um, so you do have to think about, show me instead of tell me, show me what you know, and the keyword there, know and show, you know, back to show versus tell, you know, like we learned in grade school and literature class and things like that. Um, so we really have to make sure that I, I hate the world that we're in kind of in a way, because I feel like I'm assuming bad things, you know, but I'm really trying to protect the, protect the learning environment by looking at those discussion board forums, those assignments, are they tied to something that where they can show me what they've learned, you know? So is it live presentations of your term projects instead of recorded ones? Is it coaching sessions? Do you bring in industry experts to help you with your class and give those students one-on-one -on -one time? Maybe there's things you just have to change. And that's what we've been looking into. Instead of a paper a week, a board forum a, a week and a, and a simple multiple choice quiz, I, I you know, I never, and I, that's enough, but that's kind of what we're looking at is we, we got to have more personal experiences. And, and I know that can be tough because I'm sure some of you have, you know, 40 students in your class and maybe TAs and, and some stuff like that, but the gauntlet's been thrown. I, I think, David, I, I saw you doing some nodding. Um, how, how, do you, how do we do this? How do we move from move to that showing what we know and having students apply information um, so that we're assessing knowledge and just not the ability to regurgitate information? Well, that's a tough question. And I think there's as many answers to it as there are instructors in a lot of in a lot of contexts. Let me challenge the assumption, though, too which is yes, of course, authentic assessment is important. And I'm, I'm a big fan. And of course, these changes are critical, but there are base, uh, the way I describe it is this. When I go to the gym, I don't go to the gym because I need those weights to be at a higher level, I'm not lifting those weights up so that they're up. It's the process of lifting the weights that makes me stronger. And so some tasks that we ask our students to do serve no other purpose than to develop basic skills that they're going to become building blocks of important other more relevant skills. By the way, when we say relevant, um, I know, Michael, you've been focusing on the classroom, but we are on, on the workplace. But I think we all use that as a proxy for just being a better human, right, to be a good citizen, parent, friend, um, community member, et cetera, and of course, good at your job. All of those things are the kinds of things that are, you know, if you're a critical user of information, all the things that we'd like students to know. So it's, it's important, all of these really sophisticated, clever teaching techniques that I'm a huge fan of myself, rely on you having basic skills, right? If you have, I mean, those of us who struggled with math when we were kids, I still, it takes me a little bit longer to calculate a tip or do something like that, despite the fact that I own a calculator. Basic skills are always going to be important. And part of our job is going to always have to be on the motivational end with our students to help them understand not just globally why school matters, but locally. Why am I asking you to do this thing that, yes, chat GPT or SPSS or DALI could do for you? You're doing it not because, I, as I say to students all the time, I didn't ask you to write this because I need the paper written. 
I did it because the process is useful for you. And here's why. And so there's literally nothing you can do if a student doesn't care about if they learn, right? There's no, there's no solution to cheating from a student who doesn't wanna be there and doesn't wanna learn. Um, there's no pedagogical technique other than persuading them that they wanna learn. Having said that, any tool that you use in, the, in, in, in your classes that allows students to connect the material to things that are relevant to them is going to be, is, is on your side. Um, and I'll also add, and I think Capri is probably living in this world far more than I am, leveraging AI tools to have the AI do the repetitive parts of teaching could be really cool. I could imagine a world where an, a generative AI generates 10,000 accurate stats questions that my students can then work on until they're really good at them and that I have no role in, right? That would be really great. So many things we ask our students to do are skill-based and coaching skills is a time intensive job. And so to have the help with the repetitive stuff would allow us to focus on the developmental, the motivational, the creative, the personalized. So I realize that's a long answer to a short question, but it's a really complicated question. David, I'd also, if you don't mind, Van, I'd like to follow up and mention that in our survey, 48% of respondents identified increased efficiency in instruction as an important benefit to AI. There were a number of other benefits that they, that they um, surfaced, including teaching critical digital skills, which we might come to, learner engagement, improved student outcomes. But that was one notable benefit that we saw. But Van, if I could just follow up with a few other insights that were surfaced from these data data, there was a recognition among respondents that AI may be shifting the very definition of learning. I think in addition to the survey, we also interviewed a few folks. Um, I see a few of them are here um, uh, attending this webinar. So thank you to those of you who let me interview you for this. One argued that AI will upend, upend the very nature of what we do as educators. I quote, the bigger question becomes, what is learning in this environment? What is a college education? But make no mistake about it. Another important thing the survey surfaced was quite a bit of distrust, skepticism, and even fear, particularly among faculty. One respondent said, described the visceral and urgent fear that faculty express when inter interacting with generative AI, as they see those as potential tools to replace their work. Another one echoed these concerns, but also argued for benefits like these efficiencies that David brought up to help make their jobs easier and to allow them to engage in more sophisticated pedagogies in their classes. Said the other side that AI efficiencies, it is that AI efficiencies may help, help educators address a growing need for improved pedagogies. Other respondents expressed a belief that AI will benefit faculty by eliminating mundane tasks related to their instructional practices and assessment. I hope so. so. I, go ahead, David. Yeah, um, yeah I, I hope it does. I want to highlight, though, that I didn't only mean efficiency. I actually, efficiency would be great, but I'm talking about genuine innovation, and that's the kind of thing that I see that's one of the reasons that I like working with Wiley is because Wiley's got their eye on the horizon all the time when it comes to these things. So I'm looking at the sort of, you know, a, a well-designed generative coach for writing, for stats. I already exist for programming to my understanding. Um, that's, that's a world I want to live in because that stuff is hard. It's hard to have patience and it's hard to be everywhere and to give those students genuinely novel stimuli or genuinely novel problems all the time is, is something we can't do. And uh, Laura in the Q&A brings up, how does this connect back to online and asynchronous learning? And that's the answer, is that a chat bot and a really good AI tutor is around 24 seven and can really, can, can keep that student moving in the right direction until you wake up again and have the chance to respond personally. So that, that to me is that's where, that's where the wins are gonna come. Um, but we have to, I, um, I'm gonna put a pin in as I wanna talk about the nature of learning, but I don't wanna jump on top of Michael's hand, who, which is raised. <laughs> yeah, so you're, all, you're saying things I'm smiling about here. Um, 
So there's something that I, I've done a few years ago and I have still updated. Uh, I have written APIs and I've done some uh, data generation through programming and things like that to mimic Home Depot, Lowe's kind of industry, like millions of products, descriptions, pricing, all kinds of scenarios. So I generate data for my students, right? Something I could probably write a paper on, you know, whatever. But um, ChatGPT, if I give it enough prompt engineering, it can do that. It, maybe not as robust yet, but to your point, if a student needs help with something, if a student needs another example, if a student needs access to more data to practice a, a skill that they're learning, that's efficiency. Now, to my, to the point I'm trying to drive is, that means I can focus on helping those students rather than generating more teaching materials, you know, to uh, optional data sets, um, all that kind of stuff. So there are ways that you can help students. And, and quite frankly, if we have efficiencies, you know, I come from the business area. So of course I think about optimizing efficiency, effectiveness, profit, growth, all that stuff. But that means are there new things I can get to with my students? Other new journeys we can go on that weren't able we weren't able to do before. So that's what I'm really excited about personally is seeing that growth and that that potential of students out there. So I think this is this is actually a really good segue. And, and there's a comment in the chat that um, Norman Garrett made that I think is is really interesting. And that is we repeat this cycle with every new technology. We had conversations about how are calculators going to impact mathematical education. We had conversations about grammar checks. We had conversations, I, I remember the conversation about Wikipedia uh, and how that was going to impact our students in the teaching and learning process. So what I'd like to do is ask y'all, as we think about the impact of this technology, in each of those prior technology cycles, we had to rethink what critical digital skills were. We had to rethink what are the skills that we need to be teaching our students in order to, for them to leverage these technologies. So what I'd like to do is ask you, and this will be the, the last of the planned questions, and then we'll, we'll spend the rest of the time with um, uh, audience questions. But what I'd like to ask you is, as we think about generative AI now, how is that changing how we teach students critical digital skills? What are the new skills that we need to be teaching our students in order for them to effectively leverage and appropriately leverage generative AI tools? And I'll just throw it open to see who wants to start there. And can I just provide a little context from the survey um, that I sure. think on the discussion amongst um, the others here. The top reason for adopting or considering AI was teaching digital literacy skills. 52% of respondents identified that as their top reason. And then when they were asked about the top benefit, just in general, of adopting AI, 65% of respondents selected teaching critical digital skills. So clearly we see that, that folks find this important, but, but I'm curious what that needs to look like in 2023. Let me let me go back to the future and ask the question, what is, and I'll talk about writing, but I think this can apply to a, a number of other skills. Why do we, why do students write at all? I would argue there's three reasons why we have students write. Number one is because it's practice doing a thing that we think is is useful, writing is useful, writing letters, writing argumentative essays, et cetera, and so on. Um, number two is for our benefit for assessment, um, because we, up until six months ago, it's been impossible to generate a text that demonstrates understanding of a topic without understanding the topic. As my college professors used to say, nature, writing's nature's way of telling you how unclear your ideas are. And so you can't really write a good essay up until six months ago, unless you understand what you're writing about. And number three is, is kind of the, right, because it's, a, it's an art form and it's a beautiful thing and we should do it because we're humans. Transactional writing is on its way out, right? If I ask ChatGPT or um, the new Bing or whatever to write me a business letter, 
to write me um, a business plan. In six months to a year, it's going to be able to generate the text. If I with with prompt engineering, I'm not the writing aspect of that is not going to be important anymore. Any more than a you know a clothesline is all that useful most of the time if you own an electric dryer. There's a tool that will do it faster and as well. Not yet, but soon. Right for certain well-defined tasks for what I call transactional writing. Writing for assessment is in big trouble because it is now not the case that you can, you can write a surface level coherent text without understanding the content that you're writing about. That's what the AI does for you. Um, and so we're left with writing is a beautiful thing, right? And we should do it because it connects, it connects to um, our mind. And that's the key point. What is it? I, I can't formulate an argument very well, as you're, you're all hearing now, unless I write it down first. I use writing as, my, as, as a, a scaffold for my thinking. And I think pretty much every intellectual has used rhetoric, whether it be written or oratory, to do that since the Romans or the Greeks or before, right? How does, how does the next generation learn to think when using a tool that structures their writing? I don't know. And I think that the, the transition from where we are now to having a tool that does your writing for you, it's gonna change the nature of thought and of, of learning and of formulating, of rhetoric, of formulating arguments. And I think we as an intellectual community need to figure out how to teach people to think when we don't necessarily expect them to do their own writing. We can ask them to do their own writing, but they may or may not do it. I think that's that's I think that's a really interesting argument and a, a really interesting um, repositioning of of writing, David. And it it sounds like what we're really beginning to talk about here is doubling down on critical thinking skills. Um, that there's the how do you do prompt engineering? There's the technical how do you how do you leverage the technology? But really, it sounds like what we're doubling down here on is those core critical thinking skills that the liberal arts especially, and I, I'm biased, I'm a historian by training, but the liberal arts especially um, instill in students. And, and I see, Capri, I see you nodding an awful lot over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just have to say, you know, wow, we got a tremendous opportunity ahead of us. Um, and I'm going to, uh, David, as you said, uh, back to the future, I'm gonna take it a, a, another step and say, um, we have to be mindful of exposure when we're thinking about digital literacy. And Van, you were just talking about this, the liberal arts. Um, as generative AI continues to advance, we have to make sure that when we think about creativity or critical thinking that we're bringing along all students. Um, so if I was someone who was close to campus, if I was someone close to the classroom, I would be asking myself, how do we make sure that all learners, all students have a more notable, meaningful exposure to generative AI. And I'm not just saying, you know, learners who are close to technology or computer science or engineering subjects. Um, if we're really trying to think about digital literacy and um, some of these soft skills that we need for the future landscape of the workforce, then we really have to be talking about all learners and making sure that those in arts, humanities, education, literature, all of them, all different subject areas also have um, access to generative AI and have the ability to imagine possibilities and scenarios of what that could look like in the future. Capri, I just want to, oh, sorry, Van. All right, just real, real quickly before Judith and, and, and Michael weigh in, I, I want to um, double down on something that you said, Capri, about that access issue. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the issues that um, we need to be talking about as we think about critical digital skills and what, what digital learning 2.0 looks like um, is that we have, unfortunately, the possibility that we expand the digital divide. Um, these tools require bandwidth. Uh, although you can do chat GPT on a, on a mobile phone, it's not a great interface yet. Um, and we've seen that, that with ChatGPT, as Michael pointed out earlier, you know, you can use a free version of it, but it's an inferior version. 
um, the superior version is behind a paywall. And more and more of these tools are likely to go behind paywalls, or at least the, the, the best versions of them are likely to go behind paywalls. And so I do think that, that as we think about these digital skills and making sure everyone has access, that we have to think about what access is going to look like in a world where we already have these deep digital divides. Um, Judith, I didn't mean to, to cut you off, but I wanted to throw that out there. That's exactly what I was going to bring up, Van. No problem. Michael, I, I saw you nodding your head as well as Capri was talking. Yeah, no, it's I put in the chat, and I do believe it. Liberal, liberal, liberal arts renaissance, and I know those programs have been getting cut. You know, I saw some comments in the chat about that, and I don't know what the answer is, but I tell you, in my programs, we insist that students can write well, not not to find those APA seven citations and do them correctly but so that they can explain where they got their information from and that they can go through the process of collecting information for the time when somebody asks them to explain further, or I would like to review that. I, you know, I'd like to check in on that. So yeah, it's, it's a process like, like David was talking about. And, you know, I, I really believe in that critical and creative thinking, like in our programs, I give students bad data all the time. I, I don't know if any Wiley textbook company people are on the call here, but um, I don't really use textbook practice problems. They're good for, you know, if you want to learn the ropes real quick or have some initial practice, but everything we do is homemade from scratch, data sets and things like that. Um, and there's errors in the data and it's intended. And we're testing critical and creative thinking skills. We're, ten we're, we're, we're building up the tenacity and the grit because you know, you're not going to inherit a perfect world, dare I say, uh, when you when you go into the workforce. I, again, I know workforce, but yeah. So I really, I valued my liberal arts experience and I'm doing AI and traveling around and I've had an international business career that I can reflect back on my liberal arts and proudly. Our, yeah, sur it, 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 our survey indicated that there's potentially, an, there's going to be a renaissance for the humanities due to the use of generative AI and other forms of AI. And I, I can quote just a couple of our interviewees, very insightful quotes. Quote, this is going to be a challenging time for the humanities, but the scholars in this area need to be part of the discussion so that we continue the human race and are not filtered from civilization. And another interviewee argued, universities likely need more funding and focus on the humanities now in order to leverage generative, AI, generative AI's capabilities. It, it's interesting. I mean, we, we've gone from talking about artificial intelligence to doubling down on human intelligence. Uh, and I think that philosophically, there's probably, uh, for another time, a really interesting philosophical conversation about what constitutes human intelligence in an artificial intelligence world. Um, before we get to, uh, I, I want to remind folks to be putting their questions uh, in the Q&A because we're going to transition over to that. But there was one comment over in the chat that I really wanted to elevate because it talks about an aspect uh, and a use of AI that we haven't mentioned yet. And that's uh, Norman Garrett's comment, or I'm sorry, not Norman Garrett's, Mike Williams' comment about uh, the way in which some of these tools can be used, especially for students and adults that have dyslexia. Um, and the ability of generative AI to assist as a um, technological tool to be able to improve communication. And I think we've, we've seen that. I, I think we're going to have some really interesting conversations uh, if we haven't already had them in the fall as we begin to uh, involve offices of um, disability services and, and start talking about what student accommodations look like in an AI world. And are there ways in which these tools can provide accommodations, particularly for students that have dyslexia? Um, we had an op-ed piece in Inside Higher Ed a couple of months ago from a faculty member who has ADHD. And uh, they talked about how they were able to leverage, in this case, ChatGPT, as a tool to help them as, as really an accommodation tool uh, to help them move through their day in a way that was focused or more focused than what they would be able to do without that tool. 
Um, I want to move into some audience questions. Um, we had one in particular that sort of showed up uh, in the uh, conference registrations. And that is, and we've touched a little bit on it, but there's there's two pieces here with that academic integrity tool. There's this question of, are there tools that can be used to assist with academic integrity? And then the other side of that coin, I think, is again, um, folks are asking for, are there specific techniques that can be used or, or significant tips um, that can be used as we begin to change how we think about writing as an assessment tool. Um, and David, I'm going to pick on you since part of this is your bread and butter. If you want to talk a little bit about, first of all, some of these generation detective tools um, and the, the challenges that there might be in some of these detection tools, but also what can faculty specifically be doing? as they rethink what writing means. Sure. Um, I will defer to Michael a little bit on the tools later, but I'll say this. Anything I say to you about detection tools right now on June 20th, the middle of the day, will be wrong by the end of the week anyway. But at some point soon, tools are going to be irrelevant. You're not, the, the, AI, the AIs train on new data all the time. The tools train on data generated by the AIs. And so, as Michael said, it's, it's, a, it's the wheel of technology life. So relying on a, any kind of technological tool to um, detect the use of technology is, is never, is never going to work. It may work for six months or a year at a time, but it's never going to be sustainable. So don't count on it. Even our good friends um, at the big plagiarism detection um, company, um, bless their hearts, they, they, are, they have genius AI folks they put their heart and souls into developing a detector for chat uh, for GPT-3. And literally the same week they rolled it out, GPT-4 rolled out. There's nothing you can do. If a, if a multi-million dollar ed tech company is going to be behind, then what, what can you possibly do? And of course, the notion that some Princeton student can develop a detector in six weeks that, that is going to be useful in any meaningful way. It, it's, it's, it's a lovely notion, but it's not the case. So Leave the detectors aside, and for God's sakes, do not ask any generative AI if it wrote any piece of material, right? That, I mean, that's like asking a bicycle if it can drive itself, right? It makes no sense. Um, however, there's lots of things you can do as an instructor to deter and, and detect um, the use of AI or contract cheating, for that matter. In, um, in fact, a lot of the tools that that you would use to detect contract cheating, which just means having someone do your work for you, will work perfectly well for AI too. Um, and that is, goes back to what Michael said earlier, know your students. And there's lots of different ways to do that, whether it be with oral vivas, as they would call them in the UK or Australia, and having students um, give an oral presentation or even an oral exam on the materials that they created. Um, I should point out, you don't have to give every student an oral exam on every assignment. You can tell your students if you have 50 or 100 of them, we're going to randomly do a quarter of you are going to have to come in and have a 10 minute conversation with me for every for over the course of the semester, everyone's going to do one. And so they don't know until after it's turned in which one they're going to have to do their oral assignment on. So you can you can use that kind of tool to assess whether they the work is um, is original to them or not. Um, you can use process tools. Um, a lot of the chatbots nowadays have, are string are, are continuous. In other words, question A feeds into question B, feeds into question C, feeds into question D. So if you ask it for an outline and then to flesh out the outline into a paper, it can actually give interim work the same way a student might. What it, it probably won't do as well is give is responding to direct feedback from the professor based on the material in the course, right? So anything that only happens in your class is going to be very difficult for a generative AI to replicate because it's not trained on it. So anything that you can do that's contextually based 
and individually based is going to be very difficult for an AI to replicate. And that, of course, is completely contingent on what your course looks like, whether it's Michael's BI class or my research methods in psychology class or um, a Shakespeare literature course is going to look quite different. And that's fine. You're the experts on your own content. But what I would say is try to make make the materials, try to make the assessments contextual rather than universal. And I know Michael's got some stuff, too. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that, too, echo that. Um, when you were talking about that, I was reminded of all of the asynchronous online eight week classes that we have, because um, the BI is a very strong portfolio of programs for St. Mary's, lots and lots of students. Um, so I meet with our adjuncts for the programs quite a bit. And that's a population I worry about, because oftentimes we design classes or asynchronous. We plug somebody in based on a contract for the term that we need them because we're running the class that term. The challenge is gonna be how does that instructor make sure that their the spirit, their vision, their energy is in that class when the lectures might already exist, the PowerPoint slides were already crafted, the assignments were already created, maybe by a learning designer a year ago. Um, so I think that that's where a lot of program directors are gonna to have to be spending some energy too. What you just said, the context, the, I, 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 the spirit, you know, are we an instructor or are we just a grader? You know, um, I, I, I tend to think the former, right? Instructor, instruct, coach, guide, lead, you know, share your wisdom. So I think that's something I know there's a lot of deans and, and, and such on the call. I think that's the, that's one of the things I want people to leave with is, is what you said there is if we have classes that are not updated every semester by a core faculty member, you know, you might might find some challenges. So. We had a, another question that's come up several times now that I want to pose as our last question. Um, and that has to do with the ethics of using these tools um, and a couple of different scenarios. Um, one that, that Sarah pointed out was around copyright and intellectual property. So I want us to, to think about what do we do about teaching students how to ethically use these tools? And, and this can be sort of our, our last question since we're coming up on the end of our hour. Well, I think the first question is figuring out how to ethically use these tools um, if we, before we teach the students. Um, when I talk about cheating more broadly, I generally tend to say there's no behavior that's inherently cheating. Cheating happens when there's a set of rules or expectations um, that are violated in a way that's intentional and dishonest, right? Um, and actually intent can, can be a little iffy too, right? So if I, have a, I, have a I had a colleague who was a law professor and he said plagiarism in law is, is not a thing. The idea is that if you, there's a well-crafted argument in a brief that someone else used, cite the brief, but you know, use it word for word. That's what it's that it's how you're supposed to do it. I don't know that that's true, but I do know that he believed it. Um, and so in his classes, plagiarism wasn't a thing. Um, whereas in my classes, that would have been a really bad violation of both the rules and the spirit of what we were trying to do. Um, and so I think whatever we decide the right thing to do with these myriad tools is transparency is gonna be one of the hallmarks of what we ask students to do. If you're gonna use generative AI to help write this paper, I wanna know exactly what your prompts were. I wanna know exactly what, what it did and what you did. If you're gonna use it to debug a program, maybe that's okay, maybe that's not. What do I know? I'm a psychologist. But that's something that you, that's between you and your learning community as, a, as an instructor. So the ethics of this come from transparency and from a genuine desire to learn both on our part and on theirs. And as long as everything we do is transparent and directed towards student learning, which by the way, could get to the notion of ungrading sort of sideways, but um, that then, then you're on strong ethical ground. If you're doing it for yourself as the instructor, if the student is doing it to avoid doing the learning or if they're being failing to be transparent, then I think we see that those are where the ethical problems are. And those are the things we wanna help them learn not to do as best we can.
And that, that's a really facile question to a, uh, answer to a really complicated question. So I apologize for that. No, I, I, know, I like I that you're bringing up transparency. Michael? I know we don't have a lot of time left here, but what I'm planning to do this fall, I'm going to sit down with my students. I'm not going to be naive. They know it exists. They use it. I use it. You know, but the, the train has left the station, right? Um, but I want to know why to, 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 to connect with David there. You know, Tim, Allie, Susan, why are, you, why are you using it? Well, because of this, that, or whatever. Sometimes the answers might surprise you. I have a student that's a 4 0, wins wonderful awards, all that stuff. He was using it. When I asked him, I just want to see what else it, what I could learn from it. What else, what else was there? What, what kind of stuff it had? You know, so it's not always about cheating, is what I wanted to leave with. But I think that um, one of the things that I'll take away from this conversation, I, I love that we ended on this note of transparency and learning and really um, thinking about not how do we avoid these tools, but how do we leverage these tools in a way that will help students after they leave um, their college or university careers and move into the workforce. But that really what we're talking about here is, is, is reshaping learning and thinking about transparency in that process. So I want to um, thank our panelists. This has been a really great conversation today. So thank you all very, very much. And Kim, I'm going to turn it over to you for some closing words. Yeah, hi, thanks, Dan. I'm Kim Naraki from the WCT team. I'm just closing this out for Megan. Um, thank you so much to our panelists um, for this amazing conversation. Um, it was very thought provoking and enlightening for me. I hope it was for our attendees as well. Here's their contact information if you would like to reach out to them directly. Um, we will be sharing the recording with registrants in a follow-up email, and it will also be posted on our website. And you can also visit our partner Wiley to learn about their available resources. You can learn more about WCET, our work, and our upcoming events on our website. We do have two webcasts coming up in the next few weeks, so uh, be sure to check those out and register. Um, our annual meeting is in October, and we also have our new As We Evolve group, which is um, focused on women in e-learning. Registration is open, and we just announced the program, so please check that out as well. We are, will be in New Orleans for the annual meeting. Thank you to our sponsors and supporting members that make much of our work here at WCET possible. Thank you for attending, and we appreciate your thoughtful contributions in the chat. Um, hope to see you on our next webcast. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.